الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين for the hastening of the reappearance of the master, the savior, the avenger, al hujjat ibn al hasan al askari recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are still standing at the shoreline, gazing out to the boundless expanse of the wisdom of Ali ibn Abi Talib, which resembles an endless ocean of knowledge and of guidance towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we read and discuss his letter that he wrote to his son Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam after the battle of Safin. And we read parts of the sermon. At the beginning, I wish to read a few more passages inshallah and try and elaborate on them. The Imam says, Amma Ba'd, having introduced himself and introduced those who will read his letter, the Imam then begins his message. He says, Amma Ba'd, fa in fima tabayyantu min idbar al dunya anni wa jumuh al dahri alay wa iqbal al akhirati ilay. He says, having contemplated and having recognized my life, this world, has started its journey away from me. Idbar means to turn its back to me. My life has now left me. The afterlife has presented itself to me. My hereafter is now close to me. ما يزعني عن ذكري من سواي والاهتمام بما ورائي. Thinking about the end of my life, the Imam says, prevents me from looking at the lives of other people. In other words, it's become evident to me that what matters is my own fate, my own life. Looking at other people discussing the lives of others, being obsessed with what this person said or what that person did is irrelevant. It is something that doesn't seem to be important anymore, which is something that so many of us are obsessed with. So many of us are concerned with other people, be it in a positive sense or a negative sense. The positive is when 
we look at other people's lives and we admire what they have. Now, especially with social media, with people presenting an image of their lives, which is unrealistic. People focusing on the good things that happen in their lives, but not the bad things. Every time they go out to a restaurant, they take pictures and post them. Every time they go on a holiday or a vacation, they ensure that those are highlighted. And the consumers, the rest of us, when we look at those images, when we see what other people are doing that seems enjoyable, seems beautiful, what is the image that that creates in our minds? The image that that's how life should be. That life should be free from pain. It should be free from trouble. Because that is what's being presented to us. And that is a mistake. That is an unrealistic view of life. Because the people who post those images and show you just what a beautiful vacation they've been on. They're not showing you all the problems that they have. They're not, they're filtering all the bad stuff. And the unrealistic expectations that are created within the rest of us are a cause for trouble. It's a recipe for disaster. Because once again, it makes us think that life should be like that. We feel that is the ideal that we should all aspire to. We imagine, and I'm sure this is true for most of us, we imagine that those who are rich, those who are famous, those who are affluent, lead trouble-free lives. But they most certainly do not. Because the very nature of this dunya is a world in which the good is mixed with the bad. There might be moments of happiness, fleeting instances where people are enjoying themselves. But those moments are always marred with pain and misery and difficulty. Just to be able to go on that vacation means they'll have to go through so many problems. They'll have to save up. They'll have to work. They'll have to engage in this rat race so that they could afford to go on the holiday. And even in the holiday, do they not have any trouble? Do they not face any problems? Of course they do. But this filtered, unrealistic, romanticized vision of life that social media encourages and perpetuates is what creates unrealistic expectations. And in order to have what other people have, we are forced into a corner and so many people engage in acts of sin so they could have what others are having. To keep up with the Joneses, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence because that's what it feels like. That's the positive dimension. The negative dimension is what? It is looking at the lives of other people and seeing the fact that there is no trouble-free life whatsoever. That is also harmful because it's an unbalanced view of the world. The Imam essentially is telling us that Knowing what I know, seeing my death approaching, makes me think that I need to be focused on myself. One of the negative things that happen when we are obsessed with other people's lives is that they become the subject of conversation. If someone does something bad, we always look down on that individual and that means we neglect ourselves. Who is to say that that person isn't better than me? As a matter of fact, if you're a true believer, if your fixation is on the afterlife as opposed to this world, even when someone does something wrong, your reaction to that should be, I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope I never fall into that same trap. I hope I never do what they did. But ultimately, it's about me. It's not about other people. Because when someone does something that is deplorable, that is reprehensible, that is unacceptable, in a way, by being fixated on them, it makes me feel good about myself. 
And this idea that I am better than other people begins to take root. The Imam says, look, knowing that I'm about to die makes me feel that I need to be focused on one thing and one thing alone, and that is me. Who cares? If other people are better than me, good for them. If they're worse than me, that doesn't absolve me. It doesn't make me a better person. What it does is in fact, it makes me think that I'm better than them. I'm superior to them. One of my teachers, Rahmatullah Ali, Shaykh Baqir Alam al Huda, he used to say that when I go into the holy shrine of one of the Imams, alayhi salam, he says, I would tell the Imam that I know for a fact. Think about this for a moment. He's not using hyperbole, he's not exaggerating. This is his actual belief. A pious, learned, righteous scholar of the highest caliber used to say to the Imam that I know for a fact that I am worse than everyone in your shrine right now. But how do you know? You know when you're focused on your own flaws. If you think of your shortcomings, then you will recognize that you are in fact worse than the people that you think are bad or evil. I am worse than them. At least within the confines of the shrine. Obviously, we're not talking about Yazid and Muawiyah. We're talking about the Shia of the Ahlul Bayt where they're visiting their Imam. But how do I know that they're worse than me? Well, you think to yourself, maybe there is someone who's committed a sin that I haven't committed. So that should make me better, right? Not necessarily. Because even if they've committed a sin that's worse than whatever I've done, the knowledge that they have, the understanding, the gnosis that they have is less than me. I am supposed to be a scholar. I'm supposed to be, if you're not a scholar, at the very least, you're a believer. You're a lover of the Ahlul Bayt. You're someone who dedicates a significant portion of their life towards the service of the Imam, of their time. You go to Ziyara, you go to Hajj. And so you're much better than that. The fact that you have not committed that particular sin which a person there might have committed. We can't make assumptions at the end of the day. How do I know? But let's say a woman who wears proper hijab sees someone who's not wearing proper hijab in Ziyara. Automatically, they might think to themselves, well, I'm better than her because my hijab is better. But how do you know whether that person hasn't done a greater service to the Imam of the time than you ever will. Maybe she's not wearing proper hijab, but maybe she's much better to her parents than I am. Maybe her belief in Imam al Hussein is one that prevents her from committing some of the sins that I commit. I have no idea. And even if they've committed sins, I have the knowledge, the gnosis, the connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that would prevent me from committing that sin. It doesn't mean that I'm a better person. And so Amir al-Mu'mineen is telling us that you should be focused on yourself. The whole idea that's now prevalent in Western culture and many of us seem to be uh, engrossed in this concept as well that you shouldn't judge other people. That's not the same as what Amir al-Mu'mineen is saying. Judging other people's actions is something that we can all do. If someone does something wrong, I can sit down, contemplate on the action that they've committed, and come to the conclusion that what they've done is evil, what they've done is sinful. I can do that. What the Imam is saying is you can't be judgmental of the individual. Their actions, that's a different subject. But whether those actions make that person worse than me, I can never reach that conclusion. You've probably heard that Musa السلام, was once instructed, he went to the mount, he was speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, receiving revelation from him. Then Allah gave him a test. 
He said to him, Ya Musa, next time you come to me, I want you to bring someone who is worse than you. Someone who is without a doubt lower in rank than you. Now, that should be easy, right? It is Musa after all. And that means that pretty much everyone is lower in rank because otherwise that person would be the prophet, not Musa. Why would Allah choose Musa? So you'd think it's easy. What makes God's prophets the impeccable and exceptional people that they were is what led Musa to do what he did. So he went and on cue and on schedule when he was supposed to go back to the mount, he thought, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted me to take someone who's worse than me, someone who's more sinful. So I'll go and pick a young man. Young people are usually uh, in, you know, they, they have tendencies, they have temptations, they have desires, and they have a lack of knowledge that would put them potentially at least in a position where they would make more sins than others. So he says, I'll go pick a young person. Then he thought to himself, well, this young man that I'm about to take with me, he's young, which means that he's had less time on this earth, which means that he's probably committed less sins than I have. Now, I don't want to get into discussion about the sins of prophets versus the sins of other human beings. But ultimately, from the perspective of a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even a tiny, tiny deviation is a sin, even though it's not punishable in the fires of hell, but they see it as a sin. I'll give you an example. If you're in the presence of a senior scholar, and for some reason, let's say uh, you're leg is in a cast you've got a broken or a splintered bone and so they take you to these to see that alim but you have to you have no choice you have to extend your leg in front of him you might be compelled to keep telling the scholar i do apologize that my legs are extended before you like that i do apologize i'm so sorry i'm so sorry now even though what you've done is not technically a sin it's not even insulting you have no choice, but you keep apologizing for it. Why? Because you see it as an act of insult. Because you feel that given the status of this scholar, that you should be sitting in a much more respectful way. And so from the perspective of a prophet, the smallest, tiniest deviations, not even deviations, the time they spend sleeping and eating, they feel is an insult to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because they feel like they should be in a constant state of prayer, a constant state of worship. And so what you and I don't see to be a sinful act to them is a sinful act. So Musa thought to himself, well, this young man, he's been on this earth much shorter than I have. So perhaps I've committed many more sins than he has. He's still young. So he said, you know what? I won't take him because you have to be sure. He said, let me look for someone who's old. He's been around for longer than I have. Surely he's committed more sins than I ever could. And so he goes and finds this elderly person. Then he thinks to himself, he says, but even though this person's been around for longer, and maybe he's committed more sins, but maybe he's worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than I have. Maybe whatever sins he might have committed, he's repentant from. He's been redeemed from those sins. And so he's confused. He's like, I can't take the young person and I can't take the elderly. Who do I take? So he starts to go towards the mount, still searching, still trying to find someone who fits that description. Eventually he, sa he sees a dog, a rabid street dog. He says, surely I'm better than this dog. So I'll take it. Then he thinks to himself, but a dog is an innocent animal. A dog might be impure, sure. A dog is just an animal. He lacks the intellectual, intellectual capacity to understand right from wrong. But maybe because he lacks the intellectual capacity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't judge him the way he judges me. I have an intellect. I have the ability to tell right from wrong. And yet I'm sinful. So who says the dog is better than me? Maybe I'm worse than the dog. And so he 
leaves everything and goes to the mount all on his own. When he comes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, Ya Musa, what happened? I told you to bring someone who's worse than you. He said, Ilahi, I looked and I looked and I couldn't tell definitively whether those people or that dog that I encountered was worse than me. I couldn't tell for sure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, had you brought anybody, including that rabid dog, I would have taken profit out from you. In other words, don't judge other people and think that you're superior to them. You should always feel inferior. You should always feel that you're worse than them. But their actions, of course you can judge them. You, you, we have a very clear set of elaborate rules mentioned in the Quran that we could use as a benchmark. If I see someone drinking, if I see someone committing fornication, if I see someone killing someone, I can't even say that that's wrong because I shouldn't judge others. Says who? Of course I can judge the action, but not the individual. So Amir al-Mu'mineen says that I recognize that I should be focused on myself. Who cares about other people? Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran on multiple occasions that you should be focused on yourself. La yadurrukum man dhal idha htadaytum. Those who are deviant, they won't harm me if you are on the path of guidance and righteousness. Focus on yourself and don't worry about others. The Imam then says, this prevents me from thinking about others. Rather, it compels me to focus on myself. He says, when I contemplate on those things, it leads me to a state that the Imam refers to as seriousness. Think about the fact that most people lead their lives in this world looking for things other than seriousness. What's the opposite of seriousness? It's being playful. A lot of people are always looking, even if you're sitting in a gathering, let's say in a social gathering, people always want to make jokes, to laugh at other people cracking jokes, right? We enjoy this atmosphere of fun. And fun has, in this day and age, in my humble opinion, become a god for people. Fun is what you're supposed to supposed to be looking for the endless pursuit of fun joy pleasure happiness right even in serious circumstances at university you're sitting in a lecture hall listening to the teacher the students are always hoping that the teacher might slip up or the teacher might crack a joke or the professor might say something so that they could all laugh Amir al mumineen says no this is serious. This isn't a matter for joking or mockery or having fun. Death is as serious as they come. The Imam says, Jiddin la yakunu fihi la'ib. There is no entertainment in this. You have to sober up. You have to think about the serious nature of your fate. And this is truth that has not been contaminated or touched by lies. There's nothing more truthful than the prospect of dying and leaving everything behind and taking only our actions and their consequences with us. Then the Imam says, and I think this is probably the Imam trying to explain that, look, my death, my fate, my end in this world, it makes me focus on myself. I don't want to be thinking about other people. However, the reason I am writing to you and imparting advice to you is what? 
وجدتك بعضي بل وجدتك كلي The reason for that is because I see you as a part of me. Nay, you are all of me. You are the entirety of my existence. Now, obviously, this applies to Imam al Hassan with respect to Amir al Mu'mineen. Imam al Hassan is a part of Amir al Mu'mineen the same way Amir al Mu'mineen was a part of Rasulullah, and Imam al Hussein was a part of Amir al Mu'mineen as well as Rasulullah, Hussein al Minni wa Anamin. Hussein. So this applies in this context, but it also applies to all of us. A father cares about his son. Why exactly? Because he's his son. There's a selfish element to it, right? But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forged us and created a relationship between parent and child that is so strong the parent feels like the children are a part of themselves. The Imam says, Bel kulli. No, no, no. You're not just a part of me. You are my legacy. You are how people will view me. You represent me. Obviously, now genetics have proven the close relationship between a father or a mother and their children. But the Imam is highlighting this critical point that look, you are a part of me. In fact, you are my entirety, which is why I feel compelled to impart this knowledge to you. If something were to happen to you, it's happened to me. And not just that. If death approaches you, it's approached me. That's how the most difficult thing we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the most difficult thing a father or mother has to endure is the loss of their children. The Imam says, if death comes to you, it's like it's come to me. Then he says, I'm concerned about your affairs the same way I'm concerned about my own. من أمر نفسي فكتبت إليك كتابي هذا مستظهرا به إن أنا بقيت لك أو فنيت. So I am writing to you this letter so that you would use it as a backing. مستظهر ظهر in the Arabic language means back. The Imam says use this letter as a backing for yourself to support you, to help you navigate your way through this life. And so then, whether I live or die, it will make no difference. Because I have provided to you my wisdom, my knowledge, and my understanding of this life. And it doesn't matter anymore. If I leave you, you can still refer back to these teachings. Now, so far, the Imam has been speaking mostly about the problems, the diseases, the ailments, the difficulties. Then he goes on to provide solution. But if you think about the introduction thus far, the Imam is focused on a few key themes, perhaps the most important of which is what? It is our inherent weakness, our intrinsic inability to survive this world and to go through this life without help, without guidance, without support from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For instance, when the Imam begins by speaking about death, he's saying that you are literally one step away from death. Have you never seen those videos where uh, they, you have traffic cameras documenting crashes but a lot of these videos show individuals escaping absolute certain death and you could literally see it before your two eyes a split second window and this person would have been among the dead a split second window and they would have been crushed under the wheels of a truck or a car or a speeding train a split second window 
and they would perish. And yet, for some reason, they lived. This shows just how weak and vulnerable we really are. Amir al-Mu'mineen focuses on that. He says, you have to remember your weakness, your fragility, your vulnerability. Why? Because as we said, one of the major cardinal sins is arrogance. And we all have a propensity towards arrogance. Each of us, whether we like it or not, whether we're good, bad, whether we're trying and, and striving, or we live through life carelessly, we all have an arrogant streak, a propensity towards arrogance. There is a beautiful hadith, which I don't want to get into, where Imam Zain al-Abideen, alayhi salatu was salam, the Imam talks about why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the soul, he then placed the soul inside the confines of this body. Why would our existence be composed of two parts? The soul being the first and the body being the second. The Imam says the body is like a prison cell. Allah placed the soul inside the body so as to prevent and tame the propensity towards arrogance that we all have. The Imam explains that the soul is a powerful entity. By the way, contrary to what some people might tell you, the soul is a physical entity. And it makes perfect sense. The soul is not immaterial. It's not metaphysical and that's why it gets to be confined in the body if the soul was metaphysical if the soul was not confined within time and space how could it be inside of me how could it be distinguished from other souls this is a philosophical notion and it's absolute rubbish but given that the soul is material it's created from a different matter than the body which allows it to possess powers that the body simply doesn't have. The soul is called ruh in Arabic. One of the names of the soul is ruh, right? The imam says that ruh comes from rih, just like air is composed of a different substance than solid brick. The soul is composed of a different substance than the body. And because it has these air-like properties, because it has greater powers, it can travel farther distances at a much faster speed. It can carry much heavier loads. It can do things that the body simply cannot. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the soul inside the body so that we are tamed, so that we're shackled, so that we don't feel that we are invincible, that we're all powerful, that we can do whatever we want. The Imam then says, Subhanallah, despite being imprisoned in the body, despite having all the burdens of a physical body where you get tired, you have to sleep, you have to eat, you walk a little bit, you get exhausted, and all these problems that come, you get sick, all these problems, they have not prevented mankind from being arrogant. And you still have people who claim to be gods. You have people who claim to be prophets. You have people who claim to be representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like some of these clowns that we're seeing today. There is one who lives in London now. He claims to be Al-Mahdi. He says, I am the awaited savior. He doesn't speak much Arabic. All his sermons are in English, right? He wears a hoodie, creating an air of mystique for himself. So you don't see his entire body or his, or his head. And he gives these sermons in English. And he says, I am the Mahdi who is supposed to cleanse the wor world from oppression and injustice and bring about justice and equity for all. Well, tell that to Gaza. What the hell are you doing in London? If you're here to cleanse the world from oppression, what are you doing in some London warehouse giving sermons and speeches? You pathetic liar. You conniving deceiver. And this tells you that sometimes people become so self-obsessed and so arrogant that he can lie through his teeth in the most unabashed manner and nothing stops him.
he's that arrogant. The Imam says that despite diseases, despite a tiny virus, all of the virus, the, remember the COVID pandemic? SubhanAllah, it feels like ancient history now. The COVID pandemic was caused by the novel coronavirus. I remember at the time they used to say that scientists have said that if all the coronaviruses in the world were gathered together, they would fit in a can. And yet, look at how this tiny virus shifted the geopolitical landscape in the world. Look at how it completely paralyzed humanity. How many com companies went bankrupt? How many people died? Millions of people died because of this tiny virus. And you think you're somebody? You think you're a prophet? You think you're an imam? You think you're a demigod? But we all have this propensity. Some of us are able to tame it better than others. But we all have it. So the, the theme that you find in the introduction thus far in the, the letter of Amir al-Mu'mineen to his son Imam al-Hasan is about our weakness. It's about the fact that we are too weak physically and we are too weak emotionally and psychologically as well. We fall for sin. We fall for the smallest temptation. The Imam says you have to wake up. You have to be careful. And as I said, he then provides some critical guidelines as to how to address these things. Now, I did mention, and I'll conclude with this last night, that I want to give some practical advice about how to weaken our attachment to this world, how to shift our attention and focus towards the akhirah instead of the material world that we live in here. And three things I'd like to mention uh, are number one, to be in a state of remembrance of death. And this is something that Amir al-Mu'mineen uh, addresses in his letter. To always think about your mortality, think about your vulnerability, and go to the cemeteries. This is something I've tried to make a habit out of when I visit foreign countries and uh, lands that I haven't been to, cities that I'm invited to speak in. I often try to put an effort to go to the cemetery, to visit the dead, visit the deceased, not only provide them with comfort and recite Quran and du'as and so forth, but also be reminded of the fact that today I'm walking on the face of the earth and soon enough, I'll be buried in one of these graves and people will hold, hardly remember me, let alone come to visit me in my grave. This is something that truly sobers us up and allows us to take life much more seriously. Number two, to always give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have an actual hadith where the imam says one of the things that decreases the pain of the stupor of death, sakaratul maut, which is by far one of the most difficult stages of life that we all have to go through. Just as a child coming out of his mother's womb goes through an incredibly difficult time, when we are dying, we go through the stupor of death. The hadith says that if you wish to alleviate and to decrease the pain of the stupor of death, what do you do? give sadaqah. My interpretation of that hadith, it could be something that I am not recognizing or I don't understand, but my interpretation, my understanding of this hadith is when you give sadaqah, you are weakening your attachment to this money. And because your attachment gets weaker and weaker, when you're departing from this world, you don't have much of an attachment that makes it painful. It's something you've trained yourself to do. So sadaqah, especially in the holy month of Ramadan, especially to your family and relatives, brothers and sisters. Your own arham. Traditions tell us, لا صدقة مع ذي رحم محتاج. You can't even give sadaqah to this country or that country if you have kin, if you have relatives, if you have family members who are suffering financially which means you need to prioritize them. If you have family members suffering back in wherever you come from, make sure you start with them. Make sure you do so in the holy month of Ramadan and that 
you give them generously. Number three, watch what you consume from the world around you. I mentioned social media, the endless scrolling of these social media platforms. That is dangerous, brothers and sisters. Just seeing what other people are enjoying gives you those unrealistic expectations and therefore saturates your attachment to this world. Listen to this beautiful hadith by Prophet Isa ala nabiyyina wa alihi wa alihi salam He says, لا تنظروا إلى أموال أهل الدنيا Don't even look at the wealth of the people of this world. You might say, well, there's no harm in looking. It doesn't hurt me. I'm just looking. I'm just trying to learn. I'm just trying to see what they do so that I could do it. Isa alayhi salam says, don't even look at the wealth of the people of this world. Why? Because the glamour, the shine of their wealth takes away the light of your faith. Sometimes we do certain things that take away the light of our faith. Faith becomes a chore. The person might pray and fast and go to hajj and give zakat and do sadaqah and all those things, but they just don't enjoy it. They don't feel connected to their faith. Why? One of the reasons is this. This endless scrolling of this mansion and this bathroom renovation and this vacation and this and that by other people. لا تنظروا إلى أموال أهل الدنيا Focus on what matters. Focus on yourself. Focus on your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Focus on your salat. I'll mention this one hadith inshallah, especially for the younger members of the audience to benefit from. The hadith is in Al-Kafi, the blessed collection of hadith and our most important, arguably, source of hadith in our faith. The Holy Prophet says that the angel of death, Azrael, he comes and visits the houses of believers five times a day. So they ask the Prophet, why would he do that? He said, he comes in order to see whether they perform prayers on time. The Prophet then provides a critical advantage to praying on time. He says, فَإِنْ كَانَ مِمَّنْ يُوَاضِبُ عَلَىٰ أَوْقَاتِهَا If you are someone who maintains salah and upholds salah at their prescribed time, when he comes to snatch your soul, and when it's time for you to depart from this world, the angel of death does two absolutely important things. Number one, يُلَقِّنُهُ شَهَادَةَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Muhammadur Rasulullah. He tells you, he dictates to you, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala. You don't need someone else, a member of your family, to tell you, say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Say the shahadatain. Why? Because the angel of death, Israel himself, does that. He teaches you what to say. That's number one. Number two, the other critically important thing that Azrael does if you maintain salah at its prescribed time is what? Traditions tell us that at the point of death, we are most vulnerable and susceptible to shaitan. And shaitan, now you can imagine, he's at the finishing line. You're about to leave this world. He's already tried every trick in the book throughout your lifetime, to lure you towards temptation. But now that you're about to leave, he needs to put in, he needs to double down. He needs to put in every last iota of effort to make sure that you don't leave this world as a believer. And so the shayateen gather around this individual and they start trying to deceive him. They will use things that we might be able to talk about in some, at some other point in order to take away your faith. The Holy Prophet says, if you maintain salah at its prescribed time, Azrael will then push away the shayateen from you.